tonight, if you turn to Revelation chapter 12, we'll pick up in verse 7. And now we find this strange event, a war in heaven. When you think of that concept, it's almost hard to understand that there could be such a thing. Because from our limited perspective of what Scripture tells us about heaven, we know that in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. We know that the Lord's glory far supersedes all evil. And if His glory were to come to this earth and we were to be in its presence without the cleansing power of the cross, it would destroy us. There's all kinds of things that would go through our minds when we think about a war breaking out in heaven. But as we pick up in verse 7 and down to verse 12, war has been a part uh, of humankind uh, since the very beginning, since the existence of the garden. Uh, Cain really warred against Abel. And so we're going to take a glimpse into heaven, and we have some pictures in Scripture that will help us. And so I ask you to hang on because this is one of those concepts uh, that if you tune out, uh, you probably won't get tuned back in, and if you don't tune back in, you probably won't get the point. And so hang in there as we tackle a fairly difficult passage of Scripture uh, from a theologic perspective. And we're going to see this war break out between Satan and his angels, which would be demons, and Michael, the archangel, and his angels, that angel multitude that Hebrews tells us. Uh, is on guard doing that safety duty for us all day, every day, 24-7 and 365. And so let's pray, ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we have again uh, come to, to hear your word and, Lord, to hear it proclaimed. And, God, we truly do believe these words and they are going to come true one day. And that day may not be too terribly distant in the future. And so we pray that you would prepare us tonight to hear your word. Lord, would you guard our hearts and our minds, help us to focus in. Lord, may the busyness of the week be cast aside by the presence of your spirit. Uh, in this place tonight, we ask these things in Jesus' amazing name. Amen. It says here in verse 7, And a war broke out in heaven. Seems unconscionable, seems like it can't happen. But I believe it's fairly easy to understand. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. And so we have this battle that ensues. But speaking of the dragon and his angels, they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, the destroyer, the accuser, the deceiver, the one who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, who has accused them for before God, day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. And therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Incredible picture that is yet future as we're here tonight. I believe this picture comes to fruition at that midpoint of the tribulation as God has allowed the Antichrist to come on the scene. He's a man of peace. He sets up his kingdom, his government, his religion as he takes over the world's monetary system, as, as he does so in peace, as that temple that we've already seen, that coming temple is rebuilt, 
as the witnesses proclaim, as the Jewish believers uh, begin to unfold on planet earth, at that time there's going to be a war that breaks out in heaven. On May, of, May 12th of 1962, General Douglas MacArthur spoke to a graduating class at West Point and in that graduation speech he quoted Plato and he said, only the dead have seen the end of war. And for humanity, that is absolutely the case. Mankind's sojourn here on this earth, our history on this earth, beginning with a mom and a dad and two kids, the two kids couldn't get along without killing each other. That has been the history of mankind. As sad as it is, as hard as it is to fathom, Scripture declares to us that inside of man's heart, there in Jeremiah 17, it reminds us in the ninth verse that the, the heart of man is deceitful and it's desperately wicked, and who can know it? That is contrary to the kind, friendly, politically correct view that all of humankind is basically good. The humanist view says that mankind is basically good, and if given an opportunity, mankind will do good things. Can I tell you that the history of the world does not bear that out as truth? It has not bared it out ever, and it does not bear that out tonight. The history of mankind is that mankind in his heart, in our hearts, we are still deceitful and we are still desperately wicked in us even in believers still dwells no good thing doesn't mean we can't do good things doesn't mean we can't be redeemed but we have a sin nature and that sin nature is very powerful and right now that sin nature rules this world the enemy has come and he still has his fingers he's got his claws he has his hooks in mankind and you can see that it does not take a degree in world history for you to understand that we have right now on standby on the Korean Peninsula we've got North Korea about to launch yet another multi-stage ballistic missile the one that they're about to launch is sufficient to reach probably the middle of Kansas the Japanese military forces are on alert should they launch that missile they're going to shoot it down the reason that's important is that missile technology is the missile technology that North Korea has been selling to Iran. The Iranians have adapted that technology, improved upon it, and they're now working on the guidance system for those missiles to be used as intercontinental ballistic missiles. We live in a very dangerous world wherein murder reigns. This week, you have two students, two freshman students from Virginia Tech who decide that they're going to, to kidnap a 13-year-old girl, sexually assault her, and then slit her throat because they wanted to do something exciting. That's a quote. Mankind is a mess. War exists, and Satan is behind every last bit of it. But the world has not become as wicked as it can. There is a restraining force in this world, the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit resides in every believer and is in this world in a universal sense, revealing truth, convicting mankind of sin, and of righteousness, but there is going to be a time when the Holy Spirit is going to be removed in the form of the church being snatched away. And then God's witness in this world will be limited to the Holy Spirit himself and to that which God chooses to reveal to mankind once again supernaturally. That is the time that's before us. The church is gone. The world is coming unhinged, and war then breaks out in heaven. We look at our conflicts 
it's hard to imagine during uh, World War I, roughly 10 million people perished in World War I. If you took and put people uh, 10 or so abreast, just lined them up in rows of 10, and you picked a given point, and you marched people past that given point in rows of 10, every two seconds, it would take 47 days for 10 million people to march past. Now imagine that during the Second World War, roughly 60 million people lost their lives. So six times that. It's going to pale in comparison to what will happen when the Holy Spirit is removed, God's restraining force of the Holy Spirit, God's grace in God's people, the Judeo-Christian values upon which this country was founded are now non-existent anywhere in the world as a governing power. One of the reasons that the United States is so important in world history is for all of our faults and foibles, all the dumb stuff that we occasionally do, we are still a Judeo-Christian nation. And we still put forth that value system wherever we go. Now imagine that's no longer happening. The reason that there's not war right now in most of the world is largely because of our U.S. troops keeping guard all over the world. Gone. You see, the heart of mankind is wicked. We sometimes forget that that is the case. But a battle will break out in heaven. In a, in a singular sense, you're in that battle already here on this earth. We call it spiritual warfare, amen? You have personal battles that happen. I, I do. If you don't, you can borrow some of mine. I got enough for a few of us probably. But we have that war that goes on that we saw in Ephesians chapter 6, that war that is not a uh, flesh and blood war. It's against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age. Amen? It, it's a spiritual battle. Can you imagine if there's a spiritual battle going on with us, created beings who are nowhere near as strong as angels, and each one of us is engaged in that warfare for our own lives? Can you imagine when the enemy of your souls, the accuser of the brethren, finally begins to get the picture that his time is short. Can you imagine the heat that's going to get turned up? You see, that day is coming. And as that day unfolds, we see the picture of the beginnings of it here. Michael and the dragon. Michael and, and the enemy of our souls begins to now fight. You have to remember that the dragon, Satan himself, is a created being. God and Satan are in no way, shape, or form equals. God is an infinite, all-powerful God. Satan is a created being. Is Satan the foe of mankind? Yes. Is he actually against God? Yes. But Satan is no match for God. And that is the picture here. God doesn't need to fight Satan himself. And so this battle that ensues, Michael the archangel is assigned to God's forces as commander-in-chief. Satan himself with his demons, his demon horde, those angels that are on his side, are the other side, and so you have two angelic beings. One, the embodiment of evil. The other, the supreme leader of the protectorate forces that have been watching over you since you took your first breath. And so that battle breaks out, verse 7, and a war broke out in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. You see, as soon as we saw the Jewish believers that have now come to faith in Christ, during the middle portion of the tribulation, you now have this army of 144,000 evangelists along with many, 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 perhaps millions of other Jewish people that have now come to faith in Christ. They're now being hidden by the Lord. 
Satan realizes, hey, there's something seriously wrong. I thought I killed the two witnesses. They laid there in the streets dead for a few days, but they popped back up and they went to heaven. Satan is enraged. He's now saying, okay, well, we're just going to take this up there then. And so he begins to fight. You have a picture of this, and it's important for you to understand this. In 530 B.C., the prophet Daniel, writing in the Babylonian captivity, actually told us these things as well. Daniel chapter 12, if you want to turn there in verse 1. And it says, at that time, who does the prophet Daniel say is going to rise up? Michael shall stand up. Now bear in mind, the Gospels, the book of Revelation written in probably 90 or so A.D., the book of Daniel written in 530 B.C., there's 630 years between those two, and they didn't have computers to do spell check and see if someone plagiarized something. Furthermore, we have a copy of a portion of the book of Daniel found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That particular copy has been dated to 242 B.C. So we know that the words that Daniel the prophet wrote, we have copies of them a full 300 years before the first copy of the book of Revelation was authored. And so they didn't steal from one another. Michael the archangel shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And remember, he's writing to Hebrews. So who is the tribulation about? It's about the Hebrew people chiefly. It's about the nation Israel. It's about seeing them come to faith in Messiah. So that great prince, Michael, standing over the sons of your people, speaking of the sons of the people of Daniel, the Jewish people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. It says there in the first verse of Daniel 12, even unto that time. In other words, it's an unprecedented event in world history. When that temple gets rebuilt on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in, in the coming future, uh, it's going to be an unprecedented event in history. If it even began tonight, there would be war instantaneously in the Middle East. War would break out like that. The Temple Mount is governed by the nation of Jordan. It was given back to the Jordan, the Jordanese at, at the 67 war. Moshe Dayan, after the Temple Mount was actually captured in that war, he gave it back the very next day as a gesture of goodwill. So Arabs control the Temple Mount. Now imagine a Hebrew temple being erected on an Arab temple mount. On that temple mount, as we've said, three mosques exist there today. There's no Jewish place of worship on the temple mount. The only Jewish place of worship is the leftover rows of stones called the Western or the Wailing Wall. And so imagine for a moment heavenly scene even until that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Remember what happens to them. They're going to be supernaturally protected. They'll be taken off into the wilderness, likely the rock city of Petra, and guarded. The Lord will watch over them supernaturally. Notice what it says. Remember who the people are over the sons of your people, speaking of the sons of Daniel's people, they're being watched over, they're being guarded, they're being delivered, and everyone who is found in the book, guess which book it is? The Lamb's Book of Life. So these are saved Jewish people. Ones who know Messiah. They've come to personal faith in Jesus Christ. Saved during the tribulation. They're now being guarded by God. And so this war breaks out, and it's not God against Satan. God wouldn't have to fight much of a war with Satan. And in fact, when we find him finally thrown into the pit, God doesn't have to battle him. He just says, get in the pit. You're done. It's over. God is God. He's the eternal one. Satan is a created being. He's not an equal. There's no comparison. 
It does seem at times like Satan is winning. But it's been that way since the beginning, hasn't it? It seems like Satan's winning. At times in your own life, it seems like Satan is winning. These passages at times get heavy. Remember, in the beginning, God, he was there first, amen? Don't forget that. Sometimes we, we overlook the very first, first sentence in our Bibles, in the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, Satan. Not in the beginning, you know, a bunch of demons. Not in the beginning, a whole bunch of everything else. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? He was there before the beginning. He'll be after the things that we call the end. God is the beginning. He is the end of all things. It's a creation account I want to just give you that hopefully will help you with this passage. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he populated the earth with broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, green and yellow and red vegetables of all kinds so man and woman would live long and healthy lives. Then stealing God's great gifts, Satan created Ben and Jerry's ice cream (laughs) and Krispy Kreme donuts. Satan said, do you want chocolate with that? And man said, yes. And woman said, especially if there's sprinkles on top. And they gained 10 pounds and Satan smiled. And then God created healthful yogurt that the woman might keep that figure that man found so fair. And Satan brought forth white flour from wheat and sugar from the cane and combined them with peanut butter into the world's first cookie. Adam looked at Eve and said, can we exercise tomorrow? And so God said, try my fresh green salad. And Satan presented Thousand Island dressing, buttery croutons, garlic toast, and bacon. Man and woman unfastened their belts following the repast. And God said, I've sent heart-healthy vegetables and olive oil in which to cook them. And Satan brought forth deep-fried fish and chicken-fried steak so big that it needs its own platter. Man gained more weight and his cholesterol went through the roof. And then God created a light fluffy cake and called it angel food and said it is good. Satan then created chocolate cake, heavy, and named it devil's food. And then God brought forth running shoes so these children might shed those extra pounds, and Satan gave them cable TV (laughs) and reclining loungers. And then God brought forth a potato naturally low in fat and brimming with nutrition, and Satan peeled off the skin, sliced it into chips, and deep fried it. (laughs) Man's face glowed from the residual grease. And then God gave them lean beef so that man might consume fewer calories and still satisfy his appetite. And then Satan created the 99-cent double cheeseburger and said, do you want fries with that? He said, yes, and supersize it, please. And Satan said, it is good. And man went into cardiac arrest. God sighed and created quadruple bypass surgery. And then Satan created HMOs. Kind of explains it, doesn't it? (laughs) As crazy as that is, it's really a picture of the the battle that's been going on. All these wonderful things that God does for us. And and, and then the enemy comes along and he twists it and tweaks it and bends it and, and takes something that's good. And he can't create anything, but he can pollute stuff. And so that's the picture of this battle that's going Uh, to happen one day in heaven. Ezekiel chapter 28 actually gives us a glimpse of what happens uh, in Satan. Verse 12 in Ezekiel 28, 
And it gives us a picture of, this, of the king of Tyre. And it very obviously is not talking about the king of Tyre because it goes on to describe a being that was in existence in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that would be a, a pretty small group of people. It wasn't Adam, wasn't Eve, so you guess who the other person was. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold. And the workmanship of your tembrils and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. In other words, this is an angelic being that, that has almost the entire glory seen that we see in Ezekiel's vision of the throne of God. I mean, this is an angelic being that God has poured virtually everything into. You were the anointed cherub who covers. It, it's that picture. Remember on the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubim. They faced each other, and with their wings, they covered their faces, not wanting to see the glory of, the go of God as God would meet there in the mercy seat. It's as if those two angels, it's like God created Satan to be in that position. But he says, I'll have none of it. I established you, and you were on the holy mountain of God, and you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were, notice this, created, till iniquity is found in you. We know that story from Isaiah chapter 14. Those I will statements of Satan himself. I will become like the most high God. I will exalt my throne above the heights of heaven. In essence, Satan made the choice as a created being. We all have the marvelous gift of choice, able to choose this day whom we will serve. And Satan makes the choice even in the glorious presence of the heavenlies. It gives you an idea of the depth of the depravity that man can reach if Satan, a created being created in heaven, could become so enamored with himself, at times you, may, you might just become a little enamored with yourself. Created beings do that. But without choice, love cannot be validated as real. You have to be able to choose to love. If you're forced to love, it's not love. It can be power, it can be all kinds of things, but it's not love if you're forced to give it. it might be obligation. God created Satan and placed him in leadership, the top angel, if you will. We always joke, but it really do, does give the picture that he was the worship leader of the heavenly choir. The timbrels, the pipes, those were the instruments used for heavenly worship. He was set over that whole scene, perfect on the day that God created him. But he was created with that free will. And so he begins to rebel against God. By the time we get to chapter 20, when Satan's finally cast into the, the fire, you, you can see the power of God because God just basically says it and does it. Boom, done. You're out of here. It's over. And so we get a picture that finally God is going to allow this no longer. So these two angels, Michael and Satan, highest order of angels, even though Satan himself at one time, you know, you could almost look at them as, as equals in that sense. Created in that upper echelon, the highest rank, Satan began to pick at God's people, and he's been doing it ever since. And so finally in our passage, we see Satan get kicked out of heaven. Now imagine that if he's not here all the time right now, what do you think the world is going to look like when he finally makes his dwelling place here? Because right now he can kind of come and go. And we're going to get a picture of this. 
verses 8 and 9, but they did not prevail. Satan doesn't prevail. Remind yourself, Satan doesn't prevail. He loses. There was no place found for them in heaven any longer. And I want you to underline that, any longer. Satan has had power for a time, but it is governed by the sovereign plans of God, and he will not have that power one nanosecond longer than God says it is so. He has limited power, he has limited authority, and one day God's going to do exactly what God has always planned to do, which is put him where he belongs. And so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. You can see the connection with the garden. Called the devil, Satan, the accuser of the brethren who deceives the whole world. And notice where he was cast, to the earth. And this can't be talking about when he first fell. Because this whole scene happens still yet future from tonight. And his angels were cast out with him. There's an interesting passage in Luke chapter 10. Jesus himself says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Almost implying that this has already happened. But in reality, all that happened to Satan when he fell was his permanent residence used to be in heaven with the angels. He now has temporary ability to go and do exactly what Scripture says he does, and that is to accuse day and night. He is a liar, he is a thief, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. And so he still has, in essence, the easiest way to understand it, his quarantined uh, ability to, to accuse before God. And we see that very easily in the book of Job. And if you'll turn there, uh, turn to Job chapter 1, we'll pick up in verse 6. Difficult as it is to understand, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Verse 6, Job chapter 1. Now remember when this book was written, the book of Job was written after the flood, but before the life of Moses. So the book of Job chronicles the history. uh, It's one of the oldest written histories of all humankind likely 2,000 years B.C., at least 15 to 1,800. So this story tonight is nearly 4,000 years old. And now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So this is after the flood, so it is not during the period of the garden. It's not when Adam and Eve were still in the garden. This is after the flood, and Satan came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. Have you ever seen some of those poor folks who are looking for that next Fix. They're looking for that next drink. They're looking for that next thrill, that next high. And they are walking back and forth, pacing. They are trying to figure out how they are going to get from where they are to where they want to be. They are absolutely out of their mind, possessed of that next high. That is Satan with deception. He goes to and fro, back and forth antsy as anything could have ever been ever in the history of the universe and it's with deception he's like oh i gotta deceive about i gotta lie about brian i gotta lie about jeff i gotta i gotta lie about connie i need to go tell a lie about somebody right now john's gospel reminds us that he is the father of all lies honey for every lie that's ever been told He was the initiator. He started in the Garden of Eden. What did he do? He lied. He said, surely hath God said. He's just trying to keep something from you. He knows that you'll be like, as soon as you eat that fruit, you're going to be just like God. 
Here's the scary part. That's actually part true. That is exactly one of the things that God was trying to protect them from. I don't want you to have all the knowledge that I have. I, I'm protecting you from some things. And so you can eat of every tree in the garden except for that one right there, the knowledge of good and evil. You don't need to know that. Everything else, tree of life, you're going to live eternal. And so the enemy, going to and fro, accesses the throne room of God. Now whether he does that from some, you know, Star Trek force field, I don't know. People, I've had Bible college students, well, you know, it's impossible. No, it's not impossible. God's God. Be very careful about what you tell God he can't do. That's not going to work out very well for you. If he says it, you can believe it and count it. How he does it, we may not know. I believe it's very much like a quarantine. It's like Satan can go here but no further, and he has the ability to access, to, the, the ability to speak to God and to accuse Remember, he is not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. He absolutely is not omnipresent. He cannot be in all places at all times. He does not have all power. He does not know everything. But he knows a lot, and he's really fast. And so he gets information from his minions, all those demons, those satanic angels that have went and left heaven. Remember, when they were cast down, the tail drew a third of the stars with? They're all roaming around picking up intel on you. Hey, Satan, tell God this. I saw, I saw what Jeff was doing. Go rat him out. He's a great deceiver. And notice that it switches gears to say he deceives the whole world. When you pull the Holy Spirit out of the world, that's going to be a little easier task, isn't it? Because right now we have the Holy Spirit in us to help us understand the difference between truth and a lie. And we understand the truth, and the truth has set us free. You get the picture? You see, now the enemy's going, hey, I got them. There's no more, there's just this little group of Christians, and they're, they're, they're being hidden. God's taking care of them. He's out deceiving. He's just going at it, tooth and nail, just like he did with Job. He's after the whole world. In James chapter 4, it, it just reminds us of this whole picture. He's, he's like, where do those wars and, and those rumors of wars come from? Well, they come from Satan himself. Feeds man's heart with all kinds of evil things. He begins to twist it and tweak it. Anybody in here ever gotten into some kind of crazy situation because you didn't quite have all the facts? I have. You believe somebody said something, you started to act on it, and all of a sudden you realize, oops, it wasn't quite true. Now multiply times a few hundred billion and the enemy feeding lies into people's minds and those lies compounding. You know, we talk about a string of lies. That's why if you tell the truth, you can forget it. But if you tell a lie, you need to remember it for the rest of your life. They all compound one on top of another, amen? Liars have to remember their lies. That's why that all unravels. Now imagine that Satan's lying schemes are about to unravel. He's going ballistic. You see, if we have the Lord in our life, we pray for wisdom in the Holy Spirit so that we won't be deceived by his lies. We'll know that truth. You see, he's spending his time accusing you, accusing me. Notice what he's actually doing. There's a Roman office, and it's called the Delator. And I, and I want to show you how this works in verse 10. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ have come for the, notice it, the accuser of the brethren. Satan's lost his position in heaven, finally. 
He can no longer go and accuse you night and day before God. All those, you remember those moments of condemnation and fear and doubt when the enemy comes against you and in your mind and you know you're a sinner, amen? In essence, you know you're guilty. Yes, I did it. And so what does the enemy do? The enemy comes against you. Well, you know, God's grace isn't enough for that. <laughs> you might as well just kiss eternity goodbye. Well, you can forgive a lot of things, but not that. And the enemy seeks to just pound you with condemnation. That's why Paul, writing to the Roman Christians, said, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Because the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And so the enemy is still trying to go to God saying, Yeah, well, look what your kids are doing. As parents, we, we have that little thing going on in our lives. Amen? You don't really like it when your neighbor comes over. You know, your son just threw a rock through my window. They bring that accusation. You're looking for your, I'll kill you. It's over. No, you don't think that. The first thing that goes through your mind is, I'm going to try and figure out who actually threw the rock because you don't want to believe it's your kids, right? You raised them. You, you taught them better than that. They may not be the sharpest tools in the shed, but they don't throw rocks through people's window. Amen? So, so as parents, we defend our kids. So God's automatically on your side. Now imagine you have an eyewitness. Somebody that saw the other neighborhood boy throw the rock through the window. The accuser of the brethren says, now nah, it was your kid. Your advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, goes, oh, no, it wasn't. Praise God. Now imagine that accuser can't even get there anymore. You see, during Roman times, the delator, it's a, it's a Roman idiom. It was, really was kind of like a liar for hire. It was like a, a person who would go around just trying to find little tidbits of things that were kind of truth, but had just enough slant to them that if shared with the Roman authorities, they would get you killed, get you put in prison. The Roman government actually paid for those people to go around and kind of get the goods on people. That's exactly what Satan's been doing. He's been trying to get the goods on you. And so he goes back and forth and tells God, look, I, you know, I, I heard Jeff in his mind. He thought that. It's going to come a day when he's not going to have that access anymore. You can almost hear the enemy speaking about, his, about us, about you, about me. You can kind of look at it like, Satan, like the prosecuting attorney, walks into the courtrooms and very easily, easily put into that legal sense. Your Honor, how can this man love you? Look what he did today. Look what he thought today. Look at his failures. Look at his weakness. You know he did those things. Would never tell a joke like that. He was actually one of your kids. Look at the evidence before you. Can't you see with your own eyes? Look, Your Honor, here's the weapon. Caught him red-handed with it. Can't imagine what else he's done. I mean, we caught him with these things. What the enemy does. The scary part is it's true. You did it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, lest you forget. There is none righteous, not one. Amen? So the delator, the prosecuting attorney, has absolute ability to speak those things. Look what he did. So what happens? We have another wonderful picture from the book of Job. If you're still there, if you've got your finger in it, verse 9. Here's the accusations. And so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Hear the accusing. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and his household? Around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. Now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Do you hear the accuser of the brethren? 
you see those things were true. God had had his hand on Job. But the problem was the motivation that, that Satan's trying to put forth here about Job is absolutely inaccurate. It's not true. And you see, those accusations would be borne out in Job's life. Oh, he'd struggle, he'd stress, he'd have strain, he'd sit in the city dump with a piece of pottery and scrape his boils. He would even challenge God. But he would also say with his own lips, I know that one day I will stand on this earth and I will see my Redeemer face to face. You see, the enemy is still in the business of lying about you. And then steps in Jesus, the best defense eternity in the world. The advocate, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. Very important that you understand there's a subtlety that's used here in, John, in John's letters. The first word he uses there for sin is hamarte. It's a singular sin. It's one. But you might not sin. When things come, something pops up that you wouldn't do that one thing. For if anyone commits a sin, same word, we have an advocate with the Father. In other words, it's not teaching that you have privilege to go do anything you want to do. But when you do fail, when you do stumble, when, when you do something dumb as a hot rock, when you leave your spiritual brains in a bucket someplace and you go do something dumb, you have an advocate. You have a defense attorney with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. That's who's defending you. So back to our heavenly scene. Satan's coming and going. He's saying, well, Jeff did this. Jesus is going, yes, that's right, he did. But I paid for that on the cross. Notice what I just said. I didn't say Jeff didn't do it. Jeff did it. But it was paid for on the cross. You can't hold that against him. I already bought that sin. It's done. It's over with. You see, that's the best kind of advocate because you can't find that, you can't put that person in prison. Because every time the enemy comes and says, Look what Jeff did, Jesus says, Yeah, but look what I did. Yeah, but look what Jeff did. Yeah, but look what I did. Amen? Amen. The blood of Christ has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Amen? So that advocate is more powerful than your enemy. The delator is defeated because the paraclete, the advocate, has come alongside and has defended you. The enemy's trying to say, look, you're, you're, you're guilty. In 1 John 3 and verse 6 is through 9, I'll just give you a little cross-section of it. Whoever abides in him does not sin. And it doesn't say singular there. It says hamarte. In other words, doesn't practice sin doesn't engage in repetitive, sinful behavior without repentance. You see, that's that keeping work of grace. On one hand, you have the sanctifying work of grace that cleanses. On the other side, you have the keeping work of grace that says I, I, the Lord is powerful enough to keep you out of sin's jar. You need to know that so that you can walk in victory. And so your advocate, you know what? You, you don't have Gloria Allred or Larry H. Parker or Jacob M. Ronnie up there fighting for you. You got the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Heaven, fighting your legal battles for you. So when the enemy comes, Jesus says, mm -mm -mm. Sorry, I already took care of that. Did it at Calvary's cross. Uh, Father God, I, I rest my case in it is finished. Amen? That vicarious work is the grounds for your acquittal. You're guilty, but you're acquitted. You get to go free. Positionally, we're seen as perfect. 
That's why Jesus said there in John 5, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Amen? That's why this passage closes the way it does. And they overcame him. They overcame the delator. They overcame the liar. They overcame the accuser. They overcame the destroyer. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. He who confesses me before men, I will confess them before my Father who is in heaven. That confession that we make, Jesus Christ is my Lord. The word of their testimony. You, you see, they didn't love their own lives unto death. As you think on those things, this closing picture that's given to us here, three things. The blood of the Lamb. Anybody in here thankful for the blood of the Lamb? Amen? Without it, you still have all your own sins. Only takes one to keep you from heaven. Praise God for the blood of the Lamb, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's sufficient for everything you have ever done, everything you are doing, and everything you will ever do. It's enough for all of it. That's why there, we are overcomers. They will be overcomers. Anyone who puts their faith and trust and hope and with the testimony of their mouth, the word of their testimony, the outward showing of that victory, that's why we get baptized. That's why we tell people about Jesus Christ. That's why we're known as believers. That's why when someone asks you, are you a Christian, you go, yeah. Not, well, you know, I go to church. <laughs> church can't save you, folks. It's the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. Church can't save you. You came here to, to be saved by coming to church. You ain't getting saved by no church, not this one or any other. You're saved because Jesus Christ died in your place on Calvary's cross. His blood was shed for you, and that blood is what's cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Amen? Make it clear. You have to make it clear, folks. Don't have a false gospel. False gospel says, well, I went to church. My parents have a Bible. Anybody else get, I was, I need rubber bricks to throw at my TV. That picture of Donald Trump holding up his grandma's Bible, he wouldn't know a Bible if it bit him in the nose. And I'm not challenging it. He hasn't, he, notice he hasn't said one thing about salvation in Jesus Christ. He said, I own a Bible. Well, so does everybody else in America. That don't make you a Christian. Makes you a Christian is believing on the only begotten Son of God. That's what makes you a Christian. That's what makes you an overcomer, not knowing about religion, not going to church, not having a bumper sticker. You can have all kinds of bumper stickers and be very lost. I know I had a car like that. In case of rapture, this car will be unmanned as you're in the back toking, you know. It was already unmanned. There was no man in it. And they didn't love their lives unto death. you remember what Jesus said? If you want to be my disciples, you need to pick up your cross and deny yourself and follow me. Amen? That's loving not your own life unto death. That's not, well, I want to keep my stuff. I want to, you know, I kind of like being a rotten, filthy heathen. you got to give that stuff up. That's why Jesus said there in Matthew 16, what does it profit a man if he were to gain this whole world and lose his own soul? It's because you got to trade your garbage for his gold. you got to make a swap. Because to here, Lord, you, you can have my trash. I'm going to pick up my cross, and I'm going to follow you. 
I'm going to lay my life down because you laid your life down for me. That's how you become an overcomer. It's a three-step process. You have to receive the blood of the Lamb. You absolutely have to bear witness to that with the testimony of your life, with the words you speak, the actions you undertake, and you must deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him. You are not a child of God unless you do those things. Now, having said that, it's real simple. It's not like it, you know, it's some massive process. It's like you trade in the old you for the new you. You give up the trash that was your old life for the gold that is your new life. You put off the old man, you put on the new man. You receive by grace and through faith this new life because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus and the old things start passing away. But make no mistake. Just uttering Jesus' name doesn't get the job done. You need to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. All of it. Everything he is. You've got to have that right. That easy believe- believism that the world teaches today, I don't believe it leads unto salvation. Maybe somebody is going to get saved. That I'd rather doubt it. And that's not meant to point my finger at anybody. That's to say scripture says what it says. This is what happens if you're an overcomer. That's what it says. We just take it for what it says. And I want to be an overcomer. Why? Because time's short. Time's short. Now it's short for the enemy, and therefore rejoice, O heavens, for you who dwell with them, for woe to the inhabitants of the earth. You see, Satan's going to get tossed down here to this earth, and all hell's going to break loose. You don't want to be here for that. Daniel 9.27 gives a picture of it. Again, Daniel had a vision of these things before they happened. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, that he, the Antichrist, one week, one period of seven years. And notice in the middle of that week, that would be three and a half years. When is the temple rebuilt? Three and a half years. When are the witnesses killed? Three and a half years. When does the battle happen in heaven? Three and a half years. What happens is that three and a half years? Satan comes back here because time is short, and we're told that. He knows his time is short. Notice that in verse 12 there in Revelation 12, and he'll bring an end to the sacrifice. Well, where's that sacrifice and that offering happening? In the rebuilt temple that's on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Hasn't been going on for 2,000 years, since AD 70, when that temple, the Herod's temple, that shining temple was pushed into the Kidron Valley. The Romans destroyed it, sacked under Titus. And on the wing of the abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. The Antichrist enters that rebuilt temple, says, look, you've got to worship me. And, And Satan now comes back and just empowers all of the evil in the world. You think it's bad now? We've had world wars. Won't be anything because your Bible says that about half of the world's population will be wiped out during the tribulation. If that happened tonight, that'd be 3.5 or so billion people. Here's the good news. All you need to do is give your life to Jesus. Trust in the blood. Give testimony with your word. And then pick up your cross and follow him. And you'll be saved. You don't have to worry about it. When the trumpet sounds, you can be with the rest of us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't mean to make light of it. It's that easy. It's that simple. Because God will do the work for you. He gives you the grace to save, and he gives you the grace to be kept. Then he gives you the grace that that life that you now live will be worked out of you. And so tonight... Remember you're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony, and by surrendering your life fully to Christ. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Father God, we thank you that this is true, Lord, that one day you're going to kick the accuser of the brethren out of heaven.
Lord, never more to speak a word against us. Lord, it can't be too soon. In the meantime, pray that we'd fight that good fight. Lord, that we'd gird ourselves up with that armor. Lord, that we would trust and rest in the blood of the Lamb. The ransom has been paid. Lord, that our testimony would be sure that the, our word speaks of our Lord. Lord, we pray that that surrender that we have our entire life, Lord, given to you, would allow us to pick up any cross, bear anything, follow after you. Lord, we count not our own lives dear. Lord, pray for anyone that's here tonight. Lord, they've never made that profession of faith. God, as we close this service in song and as some of our pastors, prayer warriors come forward, pray they just come and be prayed with, prayed for. They'd invite you, Jesus, into their lives. You'll do the work, Lord. You've given us grace. That grace is a free gift. And Lord, the work of sanctification and maturation, making us into new creations, you'll do that. Lord, so that our testimony will be sure. We bless you, we praise you, we thank you. We ask all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen.